for example, we might consider a model of archaeological practice based around, uh, in part, Richard and Daniel Suskin's model uh, of professional work. So on the one hand, we have the idea of archaeology as a craft, which we often hear about in relation to practice, field work uh, as a craft practice, the idea of archaeology as a technical craft, which requires the acquisition of a creative set of manual and visual skills, it's the sorts of things that, that Matt was talking about earlier. And then we have standardization, uh, which is often seen as being restrictive to craft practice, and it's often been resisted uh, in archaeology. But the routinization of practice is seen to prevent errors, to ensure uh, consistency, and reduce the duplication of, of effort. And of course, all of our archaeological information infrastructures are based upon the principle of standardization for them to be able to work uh, in the first place. Moving on from that, we have systematization, which is seeing the introduction of tools and technologies in support of the archaeologists. So this is everything from sort of office software through to GIS and modeling, as well as the digital infrastructures that we use for search, retrieval, and archiving. And then, of course, we come to automation. Uh, and automation is typically seen as the delegation of tasks to machines. But I suggest it's actually rather more complex than this. So I propose there are three kinds of automation in relation to archaeological practice, uh, which overlap in different ways. So, for example, most automation in archaeology, I think, is perhaps better seen as augmentation, emphasizing assistance rather than outright replacement. So we're talking about the reduction of routinized and rep repetitive work, which may be more or less autonomous. And it's very much the sense of automation, I think, uh, that Geert Verhoeven is talking about in relation to robotics. Automatization, on the other hand, is the takeover of human inf information work rather than practical physical work. And that's in particular through the development of data-driven uh, methods, which broadly maps on to the kind of uh, automation that Geert Verhoeven uh, refers to in relation to artificial intelligence. And we can see this in terms of the application of the kinds of digital cognitive artifacts that I've talked about elsewhere. These are devices that we employ to assist us in the performance of a cognitive task, and devices which are able to represent, to store, to retrieve, and to manipulate information on our behalf. And then the third category of automation uh, is heteromation which isn't really something I think we've, we've actually discussed as such, at least, uh, within uh, archaeology. It's a term that was uh, employed by Hamid Ekbia and Bonnie Nardi, and it sees humans as being free or low-cost labor supporting the technical devices, in contrast to automation, which more typically sees the human element being held at arm's length, as it were. So in archaeology, in archaeological practice, heteromation can be seen in terms of the way that we use voluntary labor in participatory digital archaeology, for example. Uh, the use of crowdsourced applications and microwork uh, systems for categorizing images, for tagging texts and creating data sets, for instance. Now, where you see auto, uh, the, the nature of archaeological practice sitting in this is obviously it sits across the whole gamut of these different aspects uh, of archaeological practice. And the incorporation of digital devices into our practice essentially can assign them a degree of uh, agency. Now, whether or not things can have agency uh, is something that's widely debated, both in archaeology and elsewhere. For example, in her recent critique of artificial intelligence, Meredith Broussard argues that just because a machine can learn and it can improve at a programmed automated task doesn't mean it has agency because it lacks any intent, it lacks any responsibility, it lacks any liability, and it's not truly independent in any case. But on the other hand, Matt referred to uh, earlier, Ian Hodder has argued that we become entangled with things which themselves become dependent upon us in an increasingly intractable cycle uh, over time. Now, it seems to me that whatever your position in relation to agency uh, and things, arguing that an automated digital device has no agency at all is a form of category error, 
it's much safer to work on the assumption that it does possess some degree of agency and then work through the implications associated with that than to ignore the possibility and be blind to the potential consequences. At the very least, uh, agency can be ascribed to devices by humans, especially given our tendency to anthropomorphize uh, them. So if a device affects our subsequent actions and decisions, then it can be said to have agency. Or if a device performs a task that could not be done without this non-human contribution, then it can be argued to share agency with the human actor. So basically, I guess what I'm arguing is that if there's an approximate performative equivalency between a human action or cognition on the one hand and a digital device on the other, then we can claim that it has agency. So if our digital devices uh, have agency, what are the implications for our relationship with them or towards them as far as our practice goes? Certainly the extent of our dependence upon these digital devices is becoming ever more apparent, even to the extent of us often having finding ourselves with no uh, manual feedback when the technology uh, fails. Effectively, we have to use more technology in order to solve the technological problem that has arisen in the first place. But I think what is often less apparent in this growing dependency on uh, our digital practice uh, is, is the way that we perhaps don't necessarily recognize uh, the, uh, the effects uh, of uh, these, in, these instruments. So, for example, we can think of the way that GPS systems uh, in survey instrumentation may reduce our sense of place. It's often suggested that if we devolve the cognitive load associated with specific tasks, it frees us up to focus on much more important things, the more interesting things. But there's a growing body of evidence that actually suggests that, in fact, whilst the automated systems reduce the need uh, for human spatial processing, the result in the human is, is poorer spatial awareness. And the, I mean, the classic instance is, is of course, the, the car sat na satellite navigation device that lands you in the middle of a river uh, because the road is no longer there. From an archaeological perspective, this is, I think, very relevant in terms of the context of digital recording uh, and spatial interpretation, as well as in relation to the experience of virtual environments. For example, James Taylor and his colleagues have discussed how the use of digital tablets on site removes the physicality of uh, graphical recording. Colleen Morgan and Holly Wright, in their examination of digital drawing in archaeological practice, concluded that digital tools simply don't easily replicate uh, the traditional methods and consequently they suggest that a complete abdication, as they call it, to digital recording should be a matter of intense consideration. In her recent uh, discussion of mapping at Chattel Hewick, Pere Hasikuzela em emphasizes that replacing paper-based recording with digital mapping is not simply about making more accurate maps more quickly but it also changes how the site is subsequently reassembled uh, by us. And in this, I think she echoes uh, Fred Limp, uh, who some time ago now argued that in traditional field survey, first of all, we go out and we observe, and then we interpret what we observe, and then we abstract from it and capture data about it. Whereas in a digital environment, we capture the data first, and then we interpret and abstract it afterwards. And in the process, data subtly changes from something that arises out of our observations and our engagement with the physical features to something that is automatically captured without the need for our engagement at all. In fact, uh, Dionysius Dimitris and Alan Lee have recently proposed that the interdependencies of humans and technology actually goes beyond a simple equivalency that technologies subvert and subdue human decisions, and that counterintuitively, perhaps, there is actually a role reversal that occurs in which the humans are themselves shaped and used by technology. And again, this reflects, I think, some of the things that, that Matt was, was talking about. As a result, they argue, where human agency becomes subordinated to automation, it's the humans that react to technological stimuli rather than the technology reacting to human stimuli. 
and in the process we become shaped by the unintended consequences of the complex interactions of these digital technologies. And they illustrate this through this, this digital, this, this uh, visual metaphor, if you like, where they graph uh, human against technical uh, agency. Where there is a very high level of human agency and low technological decision making, there's very strong human technology interactions and very weak technology technology interactions. But as human agency reduces and technological agency increases, there is a, a point where technological agency becomes much more significant and the roles reverse. And there are weaker human technology interactions and much stronger technology technology technologies interacting with themselves without the intervention uh, of humans. And you can see the top right of that diagram, uh, they also include uh, a futuristic scenario where both high human and high technological agency gives rise to a potential symbiotic human that's augmented with AI, but we'll perhaps just leave that unspoken for now. And we, but it seems to me it might be quite interesting to consider where archaeology and archaeological practice sits in relation to this visual metaphor. For example, I guess we could suppose that the majority of archaeological digital practice incorporates high level of human agency. Uh, and so consequently, a lot of our, our practice sits in the upper left uh, of this graph. However, you can see that the development of automated tools for classification uh, and for identification is, is shifting the balance towards the lower area uh, of the graph with increasing levels uh, of digital agency. Now, whether we've reached some sort of tipping point where we can actually identify role reversal, where the archaeologists are overtaken by the digital uh, components, perhaps seems a bit doubtful uh, at present. But certainly one of the implications of some of the uh, machine and deep learning projects that we're seeing coming forward in archaeology is in some respects often to replace the human experts, which suggests that we are moving beyond uh, that tipping point. Another way of looking at this is perhaps to try and place some sort of classic archaeological software uh, on position it on this graph. Now it's obviously very debatable, uh, but for example, uh, we might see um, in, in or increasing order of digital agency and reducing order of human agency, starting with standards office type software in the top left hand part of the graph, moving down through something like GIS for the sake of argument, through things like structure from motion uh, recording systems, and then moving into areas like machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence. And I suggest that this model has quite significant implications for our approach to implementing digital devices and employing them in archaeological contexts. Because altering the balance of agency constitutes shifts in power and authority, making it important to understand where the core of archaeological practice in terms of recognition, decision making, action, recording, analysis and interpretation actually sits. And establishing the, the degree of agential action uh, associated with digital devices of all kinds entails an understanding of their development and design, and not least the nature of the abstraction that has been employed in order to represent and model a task and make it computable. Recently, Andrew Selbst, Dana Boyd and their colleagues have recently written about the incorporation of fairness into machine learning systems, and they identify what they call a series of abstraction errors uh, or traps in representing domain knowledge. Now it seems to me these are equally uh, relevant in this context uh, because they arise from failing to consider how the whole context of application, in our case archaeological practice, is interlaced with technology. So what are the lessons that might, may we learn from their abstraction errors when thinking about the implementation of agential digital devices uh, in archaeological practice? Well, the issue of framing that they flag up is where the framing of the technical solution uh, is inadequate. But they also highlight a particular problem where the social and human elements of the application area are largely omitted. And avoiding the framing problem requires considering not just the, the technical parts uh, of the apparatus, but also the humans that operate them. So in other words, abstraction needs to incorporate people their decisions, their actions, incentives, and their rewards.
In the case of portability, this is to recognise that when we repurpose digital designs or digital solutions that have been developed for one context and apply them in another, we may end up with quite misleading, inaccurate or otherwise problematic results. Now the intention at the outset may be that to develop um, systems that have multiple use cases, but often it's not until it's applied in a new uh, uh, context that it becomes apparent that certain assumptions, certain procedures were implemented in ways that make it much less flexible than was intended. And there's a paradox here because if the framing issue is addressed, then the resulting system will inevitably be much less portable uh, than might otherwise be the case. The question of formalism arises in simply the challenge that is presented by trying to represent complex concepts uh, within the system. And that's particularly going to be problematic when those concepts are themselves contested or poorly defined. And I suspect that's true of a very large amount of archaeological contexts. Now, what are the solutions that's typically trotted out in technological situations uh, is that you basically employ a sort of Darwinian solution whereby you, you produce a series of different um, potential models, different potential solutions, and ultimately they will stable out, stabilize out in some sort of approved uh, form. And I'm not sure that's necessarily appropriate in an archaeological context. The ripple effect recognizes that when we insert technological solutions into systems, they change the behaviors and the embedded social natures of those systems. And so it therefore has a whole series of both intended and unintended consequences. So it's, it's very difficult often to predict how people and organizations will react to the new digital devices. And such new tools often unconsciously privilege the quantifiable over the less tangible. And I think we can begin to see this in terms of the dispositions of our digital infrastructures, for example. And finally, solutionism uh, is the recognition that the best solution to a problem might not be technology or more technology in the first place. It may be that the modeling required is ultimately comp computationally intractable, or the information that we're trying to use is incomplete, as again seems to be the case in much archaeological uh, areas. Now, Selps, Boyd and, and colleagues suggest that in terms of practice, how these issues might best be considered uh, is in reverse order. So you actually start at the bottom of this list and work your way up uh, in considering uh, the development of new devices. Now, it seems to me to be very reassuring that if that's the case, the question of whether a, a technological solution is appropriate is in the foreground. I think that's very reassuring. Uh, and the importance of the human component is also recognized. But I'd also suggest that these nevertheless contain embedded within them a whole series of ethical issues that need to be highlighted, extracted, and uh, addressed explicitly. I'd suggest that amongst these uh, are, for example, the question of control and oversight. What level of autonomy do we assign to agential devices? Retaining appropriate levels of supervision should require knowledge of the origins, assumptions, the methods, and the operation of these devices, including their abstraction errors, in order for us to use them uh, properly. And yet all too often, we tend to use tools, digital tools, without having a full understanding uh, of them. The question of augmentation and replacement simply re asks the question, to what extent do we allow individuals to be displaced by these agential digital devices. Now, it may seem a relatively remote threat uh, for archaeologists, not least because of our reliance on complex sensory motor skills, which are problematic to automate, uh, and the limitations of artificial intelligence systems typically to operate outside quite discrete, uh, well-defined application areas. But nevertheless, you know, are we content to see aspects of the craft and the profession of archaeology to be replaced by digital devices? And if we are, then it certainly raises again the question of retaining oversight. Algorithmic opacity and hidden machine bias often pops up in the news uh, these days all too frequently. But it's about whether or not we're content to not know how something works and not necessarily appreciate how it is shaping uh, what we do. 
And the black boxing and inscrutability of algorithms is frequently identified as problematic is because that inf inscrutability can disguise a range of hidden biases which, while they may ultimately have their origins uh, in human biases of their original creators, ultimately will have an impact on their outputs of these systems. The key issue here is that these black box processes obscure, perpetuate and reinforce these sorts of biases and make them difficult to surface. The question of explainability uh, should perhaps seem self-evident, but I think slightly worryingly there's a growing series of arguments uh, that in fact it is unnecessary to make these sorts of devices capable of uh, explaining uh, their uh, outputs. And I'd suggest that we should not be black boxing archaeological systems that classify uh, or categorize data without requiring some understanding of the basis upon which they draw their conclusions. It's crucial with things like machine learning systems, but I think it's equally true of, of more, more basic analytical tools for that matter as well. Reproducibility is perhaps a slightly different perspective to the one that we're becoming accustomed to, um, because it asks the question as to whether the output should always be reproducible. Because with basic analytical tools, we can generally assume that a process will be reproducible. The same inputs that we put into it will generate the same outputs. But when we start introducing machine learning and artificial intelligence into the equation, it's not necessarily the case, because these adapt to new data and new inputs, and so consequently may produce quite different outputs, depending upon when you ask the question uh, in the first place. So without detailed information about the sort of internal pipelines, if you like, the decision-making mechanisms within these devices, uh, without understanding those, which would perhaps allow you, at least in principle, to re recreate the specific sequence and consequently the decision that was arrived at, reproducibility of these devices is problematic, uh, I would suggest. And then finally, there's the whole issue of trust uh, and authority. Should we be accepting the authority of these devices without question? Studies of frequently show that devices are often seen as simply means to an end and their outputs accepted unquestioningly primarily because they derive from a digital device uh, in the first place rather than from some other fallible human being. But trust entails knowledge of the inputs and the processes in order to be able to have confidence in the outputs which makes the transparency and explainability of these devices all the more important. So, I would suggest in conclusion that over recent years archaeology has been increasingly transitioning towards more computerized automated practices, but that our consideration of the implications of this has rather lagged behind uh, the development. And in fact, I'd probably go so far as to argue this applies across the whole board of all digital applications, uh, but it, I think it becomes especially challenging as digital devices increasingly move into areas which we might previously have considered to be uncomputable, with computers being able to uh, perform tasks that might have been thought to require cognitive ability, uh, which uh, the computers are become uh, able to uh, improve themselves with little or no human intervention. So understanding the nature of their agency, the ways in which they abstract from our domain of knowledge and experience, the ways in which they wield information and take action on our behalf, and the ethical implications of all those relationships, I think are all vital for the knowledgeable implementation of digital devices in our practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, That was uh, very enlightening. Uh, thank you for uh, clarifying all of this for us. Um, do we have any questions? Yes? Uh, hi. 
Oops, is that? There we go. Uh, hi, my name is Mary Layton. Um, thank you. This was a really, really interesting talk. And I, I have a couple of questions which might be playing devil's advocate a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm really curious with this about, I want to ask the question of how is this kind of technology different from any of the other kind of technologies? How is this different from the um, computers that the new archaeologists were getting very excited about back in the 70s? Uh, how is this different from a paper form? I have a colleague who likes to constantly remind me that paper forms are technologies and that they constrict and control people's actions. Uh, paper surveys restrict and control how one can uh, categorize the world and categorize one's experience. Um, but I'm particularly struck with this in terms of when you're thinking about is this kind of new technology going to uh, take over the archaeologist in a sense. To me, the examples that you're providing are ways of technology producing data, different types of data and data outputs. But the, a map or a database um, or a, a set of categories isn't the final product of archaeology. It's not the thing that archaeologists finally produce. Archaeologists produce books and articles and conference papers and podcasts and TV shows and lectures for undergraduates. And I wonder, um, until uh, digital technology can write a book <laughs> or write an article or produce a television program for public consumption, um, are these all just degrees of different ways of making data as opposed to making data that archaeologists will then turn into our archaeological outputs? Wow, that's a lot to unpack there. Um, I th I, if I perhaps start at the beginning, I, I, think, I don't think these are necessarily different to the sorts of devices that we were using back in the 1970s. Um, because I think, I think then, um, relatively few people, if we're absolutely honest, and you know, I was there, um, actually understood what they were doing. Uh, they, were, they were able to plug their data in and they were able to get their data out, but they didn't actually understand the intervening processes. Um, I think uh, that's always been a problem. It always will be a problem. I think what ha perhaps what makes these different is that these devices essentially ha have a whole capability uh, that is perhaps rather dramatically different to a sort of you know, multivariate statistics package, for example, that we might have used in the 70s or early 80s. Um, is this different to things like paper-based technologies and so on? Um, I think in certain respects, again, the answer would be yes and no. I, I know it sounds like I'm going to be sitting on, on a fence. Um, but I think that um, in the case of these sorts of technologies, it's the, it's the capacity they have to transform the practice that we, we, we have. And I don't think, whilst uh, paper-based forms undoubtedly shape what we do, I don't think they necessarily have the same sort of transformative capacity uh, of some of these digital devices. Uh, to the extent that, as I say, you know, we, we're starting to see devices appear uh, that people see as, as replacing the human component in the chain. Uh, and I th think I may be corrected perhaps on this, but it seems to me that's probably about the first time we've seen this seriously, not just suggested, but is, is seriously um, a possibility if it isn't already happening now. You want to come back to me, I can tell. Okay, if I ask another one. Well, I was thinking in terms of your comments about black boxing, and I think this comes back to what you were saying about people in new archaeology not necessarily understanding the statistics. Uh, the Harris matrix is a form of technology. Um, uh, but most people don't understand how it works. <laughs> Very few people, I think, have read the original book that explains the theory behind it. Our context forms are a form of technology. We don't necessarily know why we use those. They're just the way that British archaeology, for instance, has always been done. And uh, other archaeologists in different countries, again, inherit these technologies of analysis, which completely shape the way that they think about and restrict the way they think about what it is. And sometimes black boxing is necessary in order to be able to get anything done if we're constantly questioning the basis. So I guess I'm still, I'm still not quite seeing how, it's, how these are completely different in terms of getting us beyond something that's a different technology for producing data as opposed to for producing knowledge. Well, I, th I, mean, I think, well, I mean, the, the, the instant answer to that is that these, these will be capable of producing knowledge because they're not just producing data. 
they are taking data and they're drawing conclusions upon that data. So the sorts of satellite imagery, for example, that Matt was talking about, you know, people are generating systems that, that do actually ex recognize archaeological features automatically from it. They don't actually require the archaeologist to be sitting in front of the screen uh, studying these images in great detail. You know, the algorithms will actually pull out the data for you. Um, so there's, it, there's, it's a different scale, I think. Uh, I mean, I, I, don't agree, I don't disagree at all with your basic proposition, uh, but in a way, I suppose I would always argue that whilst yes, you're absolutely right, things are black boxed, uh, and they're done for they're done that way for a reason because it streamlines the processes and procedures and so on we apply. But someone somewhere needs to open that black box and understand and critique what is actually going on before you are then ought to be content to use that device as a black box system. Um, so I guess that's, that's my fundamental argument. And, that, uh, and I accept that many of the things that I'm talking about could equally project, be projected back to the sorts of technologies that we've been uh, employing for the last 20 or 30 years, which have undoubtedly shaped and changed the practice uh, that we employ. But I think there's a different order of magnitude that is potentially coming down the pipe uh, right now with these sorts of devices. All right, we're running a little bit late, but I think we have uh, time for two more questions. Matt and then Costis. Mm. Hi, it's Matt Edgeworth here. Um, I'm going to follow up Mary's question with uh, kind of coming at it from the opposite angle. And I wonder whether um, talking about digital tools having agency or not, rather presupposes a kind of separation between human and digital agency. And I wonder whether that separation in fact exists anymore like it once did. And the reason I ask that is again following up on what Mary was saying, that even when we're using like paper-based technologies like context sheets, we're still doing that fundamentally for we're organizing the data for a computer. And um, the effect of the computer is coming through even that and structuring our perception at a fundamental level. So I wonder whether in fact that the things are so intermeshed that the distinction applies. I think, I think that's true. I think there are certainly plenty of instances where I think perhaps uh, the balance is such that I think I said at one point that we actually share agency. The human and digital agency is so intermeshed and intertwined that it is something that we share. Uh, many of the, the systems that we use you can perceive as basically us offloading certain cognitive um, tools onto these devices that are then able to do those particular things so much better than we can do, so much faster and process so much more data that we can. So we are effectively sharing that agency uh, with the tool. So it's, it's not a simple black and white human agency on the one hand and digital agency on the other. There is, there is this meeting point in the middle where that agency is shared. Well, thanks so much, Jeremy. I find it fascinating, as always, listening to, to your ideas and sort of unpacking these uh, kind of worms that agency can be in this digital world. So I want to go back to your model. As uh, you transfer from craft to standardization, go out this mechanization of work, really. And I was wondering, because I mean, you portrayed quite a bleak picture, you know, of the dangers of uh, machines taking over. It was a little like that, machines take control in a way, software takes control kind of thing. And I was wondering, looking at practices, because I've been working on uh, e-curators, my, my research project, and I was looking at people like, for instance, uh, um, uh, the people in the uh, Western Argolid survey, Bill Carraher, how they work with their tools and how they try to harness these tools. So for me, I mean, if you look at this curation in the wild in which uh, not only archaeologists but others, even communities, would deal with archaeological meaning making and try to make sense of evidence, etc., and use these tools, I was wondering if you have any comment to give on this other side, the side of taking back control for machines and how can this happen and how this really can affect us, the way in which we understand this uh, some unidimensionality 
of going from craft to standardization systematization, or whether through automation there's also a, a feedback loop that allows us to regain this kind of uh, primacy of uh, human intentionality uh, through regaining access and control of the tools. It's another, another one that's got a lot to unpack. Um, I certainly didn't intend to come over as a little prophet of doom. Um, I think, in a sense, what I'm trying to do is to sort of push back at, um, I think, the tendency that we've had in digital archaeology for the last 30 years to sort of you know, enthusiastically embrace the next new thing that comes along without necessarily thinking about the way in which it might change and influence our practice. So in a sense, I suppose what I'm trying to do with this is to start that process of consideration before this actually arises, which might be why it sounds a bit negative and a bit sort of alarmist. I, 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 can, I can see that. Um, I'm interested in, in your point about the sort of, the sort of feedback uh, between these, because I, 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 I don't think I necessarily had seen it in that light. I think that's quite an interesting uh, perspective to consider. I'd simply seen that you know, automation was, was, was part of a long history of, of, of development of practice, but the idea that it is actually feeding back as well uh, is something I think I'd have to go away and have a think about. That's, a, that's an interesting idea. Thank you for that. I answered all your questions there, but uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs>